Um, coming up to 30 years in IT, so I was saying earlier, that kind of makes me essentially a veteran in the industry. Um, most of that time I've spent in identity, and I'll go through that because I think the actual roadmap and the, the journey is, is really interesting, especially for you, those of you who are just starting out in identity now. Uh, love whiskey, can't deal without uh, good coffee. I love Australian rules football. So please, if you want to know more about that, hit me up. And unfortunately, my Australian rules football days are well over. Uh, I play golf now. So just quickly, it all started 30 years ago. <laughs> when I was young and impressionable and I got my first job at IBM straight out of university and back then identity was all about slash EDC slash password, uh, yellow pages, NIS, all the Unix level stuff that I would uh, looked at at university. Then after a short stint in computer aid design and manufacturing, as I'm actually a mechanical engineer, um, it's my university degree, I moved to Netscape and this was in 1997. So I was working on Netscape directory server, started off in support, then went to consulting and worked on some really big projects in Australia there. So the beautiful user interface, uh, which was all driven out of the browser, of course, and um, LDAP v3 had just come on. Then I moved to Sun Microsystems when Sun bought the enterprise part of Netscape. Um, I worked on directory, of course, and also then Sun created their own access management product because they wanted to buy Netegrity, but Netegrity wanted too much money. So Sun said, we can write that, and they did and called it Sun AM. Then they bought the Waveset product and called it Sun AM. I went to Austin and did the training on that. Uh, around that time was when the Liberty Alliance started up, so I started getting into Federation for the first time, and that then turned into SAML. Uh, it was during this time I did some big projects out at Australia's telcos and banks, and that's where I did some really large LDAP type uh, projects, which were, I think, um, did a project at Census, which was 13 million entries. That was about 2001 from memory. So yeah, pretty big. And about seven years ago, I joined Ping Identity. Again, had to start really from the baseline. I um, started off as the only technical person in Australia, did all the implementation work and, and demos and wrote POCs and that type of stuff. Um, we've now moved on to OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, and we can see the pathway, how we're devolving identity, become much more fine-grained and personalised for uh, services. And I spend a lot of my time working on open banking now. If you've heard about that in Europe, in Australia, um, in Asia, open banking is where a lot of this stuff is now being actually used in, um, you know, in anger. And we're starting to see real implementations of OIDC that are touching millions and millions of people. And I spend a lot of my time doing this, talking about it. So I was um, just talking to Howard earlier about how it's really interesting that we, um, when we live something and you know been in it for many many years, we take things for granted. Uh, what I think we need to be able to do is accept that people are just starting on their journeys. They may not understand JSON Web Tokens and OAuth token binding and OAuth token exchange, which is coming real soon. Um, those sort of things that will become the new normal for people. But it's all of that, that background that I've been through is what we have to um, give people our experience so that hopefully we're doing the right things and not reinventing the past. Now, because a lot of people here are developers and so on, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of understanding of what I've done there. I've never written code for a living, but I've always written uh, utilities and tools and so on as part of my job. So when I was at Sun, I wrote something called LDAP, LDAP SQL. I booted it up this morning. It still runs. It's from 2007 was the last time I think I made a change to it. Um, essentially what it is, it's a PL SQL command line tool. So it lets you um, execute C SQL statements against an LDAP backend. So in this case, I'm talking to ping directory. 
Um, I've got 100,000 entries in there on my laptop. You can select count star from base DN and it tells you how many entries there are. You can go ahead and describe the schema. It goes and pulls the schema out and shows you in a nice way. And then you can do stuff like select count distinct surname from base DN where given name equals M star. And that will give you back 6,836 entries there. Um, it implements pretty much the you know, 70 to 80 percent of the PL SQL piece except for uh, the programming stuff. Um, so you can do distinct, count, max, min, order by ascending, order by descending, all of that good stuff. It's written in Java and it gives you this pretty output and you can change a setting and it'll give you LDIF if you want to pull that. Um, your searches and so on out. But it does do the full CRUD as well and insert is wizard driven so I query the schema to work out what's mandatory, what's optional and then ask you what you want to do. So it was really good fun at the time. Um, I'm really glad it still works but uh, anyway a little bit of uh, what I do in, uh, in the past there. So just quickly about Ping identity. Uh, we've been around now nearly 18 years. We started off with Federation and about three and a half years ago we bought Unbound ID. So they were the guys that I worked with at Sun, Neil Wilson, David Eli, um, Steve Shoff and those guys. Um, they went ahead and did their own fork of the code base when Oracle bought Sun. They built a product and a, a company around that. Ping never had a directory in its product stack, so we bought Unbound ID, rolled that in. Our products were already pre-integrated and we built that out. So when you buy the Ping data products, you get the top three, you get the directory itself, um, you know, high performance data store, supports LDAP, REST and JSON. The data sync tool, which is a high speed data synchronization tool between different types of backends. And the directory proxy, which does your LDAP proxying, load balancing, rate limiting, operation balancing and so on. And then there's a fourth product um, that they built called Ping Data Governance and that's a data access proxy service and that's something I want to talk to you about a bit later because it's really important in what we're doing today with entitlements and, and fine-grained access to data. So let's talk about entitlements. This is something that is really interesting for me because I've got customers asking me about it. They've got data that's spread everywhere and traditionally entitlements have been organised into different silos. So there's been the operating system level, there's been the, you know, the major um, enterprise application level like CRM and so on. And you know, to a certain ability you've been able to model uh, those in LDAP and then centralise the access to it. But once they get to a certain level, they become problems and that's why Sean did a great job yesterday of talking about the issues around entitlements and roles and so on. But you know, what it boils down to is we want to know two things really. What can a person do in this context for this transaction? What are they allowed to do? So we can make access control decisions and that way we can either push data back to the application to make the access control decision or we can have something there being the gatekeeper for the application so it doesn't have to have that logic. The second thing is what do you know about the user? What are all the authorizations that make sense for uh, this user? And that's really important say when somebody logs in the first time and if you're a telco you want to be able to show them what relates to their different devices, the different plans, uh, but more than that what, how that relates to the other products that they're using for you. Because we've all had the experience where we log in in one place, we have to go to another application even though it's for the same organisation that we're buying a service from, uh, and we see a completely different view and there's no um, single view of what we have for that company. So by doing um, modelling of entitlements and then evaluating them uh, in a centralised manner, we can actually help solve that problem. So why should we store entitlements in a directory? I'm biased, I love directories, I've been working with them for many years, but you know, there are other types of data stores. I think firstly this gives you a, a centralisation uh, aspect, you've got then a single view, you can then do a whole lot of audit stuff instead of having to go around different types of 
data stores. I mean, there are products that are built to go around different data stores and pull that together, like your SalPoint and uh, Savient and those guys, the, the IGA platforms. Um, but to a certain extent, that has other issues um, that I'll talk about a bit later. Secondly, control. So having it in the one place means we can actually control who gets access to what because we've got a, a very known pathway to make changes to that. Uh, performance. So like I said before, there's a lot of data spread around. Uh, one of my customers in Australia used Siebel as their CRM system. It was taking minutes and minutes to do a query to the Siebel backend because of the way they had organise the schema and so on. So they actually had to build a high performance cache in front of that so that that information could be used at runtime for authorization decisions. If they had used a directory, they would be able to then get the performance they wanted because it's heavily oriented towards read performance. And you still allow the CRM or the MDM or whatever the enterprise system is to do the management of the more commercial information about the user. And also access, I mean, increasingly developers are the most important people in the organisation when it comes to IT. So we need to give them services that they can consume very easily. Um, you know, love LDAP, you know, not, not so keen on matching the brackets with the search strings, which is why I wrote uh, LDAP SQL. But if we can give them rest, if we can give them the, the things that make it easy for them, they will make you solve these services. And, uh, that's something that I think is really important for directories now. So, how can we manage entitlements? So, originally we would use groups and we could then use member of, you know, supported by some directories, not by others, to get information about uh, what people actually had, that second part of the, the, the equation that I had up before. Then I think it was um, Netscape who came up with the NS role attribute. Ludo's gone, but I, I was going to ask him about that. Um, that gives you the ability to do both static and dynamic uh, analysis and essentially compute on the fly your membership <coughs> of a, a group, essentially. Um, and then moving to attribute based makes a lot of sense and makes it easier to manage, as Sean pointed out yesterday. Um, the options you have, uh, you know, providing one attribute with a whole lot of delimiters in it, so you can uh, slice and dice the different uh, pieces of the role and uh, the entitlement. Or what I'd like to present today is using JSON natively in the directory. And that then gives you the ability to build out quite a complex schema, specifically for entitlements, that can then be used very easily by developers over REST. So, if we look at what the ping directory server provides for, we natively support JSON. So, we actually have a schema definition for JSON. It has all of the, the attributes that you would uh, recognise from your analysis of schema in the past. And around that, there's a whole piece around matching rules. So, with JSON, you've got the ability to store different elements, different attributes within the, the single JSON attribute. Um, we natively allow you to search on those elements. We natively index on the individual element level so that uh, performance is very good. So you've got the matching rule capability. You've got a whole lot of constraints because you don't want people putting data in there that's not going to be easy to maintain. Uh, I've seen this happen with traditional LDAP. There's a customer I won't even mention the country name because <laughs> that'll give it away. Um, they started to build out their directory and then because they were having issues modelling schema, they turned off schema checking and continued to add more and more attributes until now there's no directory server on the planet which will import their LDIF files. And they, they got me in to do a review and I said, well, guys, I'm afraid you're just going to have to go through and you're going to have to fix this mess. Um, you could possibly put an LDAP proxy in front and you know, do transformation on the fly as you're moving different applications across, but you turned off schema checking. That's just terrible. So we give the ability in Ping Directory to do a whole lot of checking on the data, uh, restricting to predefined sets of values and so on, uh, well beyond what traditional 
uh, LDAP provides. So with uh, searches and so on, there's a specific syntax to address that within JSON attributes over LDAP. You can see the different pieces there. You've got uh, different filter types and, and so on. And you know, this is reasonably similar to Skim uh, in some ways. So this is the LDAP side. Um, we also have the REST APIs that are pure Skim out of Ping directory. And then you can do the same thing uh, using Skim there. So this gives you a lot of capability. And then you can start to model. And you know, all the customers say to me, can you give me a schema which will enable me to model my entitlements? And I say, well, what do you want? And you're not the same as everyone else. How can I give you a generic schema that's going to be just for you? And by the way, that would, you know, We've got people out there who can model schemas and they need jobs. So, um, But yeah, you can start to build entitlements out very, very simply. So I, I took Sean's example. You've got location, you've got role. It's all in one attribute. Um, but it's very easy for, say, your developers who are using REST to pull that out and deal with it. Um, the, the thing is you, don't, you can go well beyond that and you can actually start to nest JSON elements. So you can start to build out really complex information. And this again is really down to what the customer needs, what you think is best for management, and uh, you know, certainly looking at performance and the type of queries that need to be done against that. So you know, I think as I get into more customer situations where we actually start doing work, this is going to become uh, interesting. Uh, maybe I'll come back in two years and tell you how that went. So what are the sort of things we can do here? Well, for employees, for example, you know, it can be as simple as access rights for applications. Really, really simple, but giving you that ability to then expose that data to more modern applications. So you know, different elements of the entitlement piece, role, location, time, uh, and so on. But also then building in additional information about, for example, relationships. So within business, it's common that you have teams form and then get pulled down, people move between different teams, people are on multiple teams at the same time. If you have issues like segregation of duties and so on, uh, it's important to know who has access to what without losing that control. So you can start to build in parts of your entitlements there around team memberships. Um, also cross brand. So as people make mergers and acquisitions and, and people move around, you get the ability to model that within the schema as well. On the consumer side, it blows out majorly. So we have not only the access rights piece, uh, but also much more of a cross product problem where you know I've bought you a mobile phone plan, but I'm also using your over the top um, television service and I've registered for the AFL streaming service and blah, blah, blah. So uh, getting to know what those rights are, uh, such that it's a single point of contact for the various applications that me as a consumer use, uh, is an important thing that we can do there. One that's really important, given the whole piece around GDPR and also around open banking, is consent. So that's where the end user has to say, yeah, I allowed you. To, um, to give access to this data to your applications or to third party developers, but um, it enables me at a very fine grained level to turn that on or off as I wish. And this is something that you know, we're dealing with uh, in the open banking space right now. So being able to model that, we have a, a, an API and a schema specifically for consent with ping directory. Uh, you can roll that in and have that as part of your profile for the user. And then relationships, you can do some really interesting things around entitlements for relationships. The fact that I'm in a family, I can then allow or deny access to certain things for my 15 year old son, for example. Uh, it could be different types of content, it could be a spending pattern for um, his plan, it could be a whole lot of things that I can then enable or disable. Um, that entitlement is something that you want to be very quick and easy to evaluate. Uh, 
uh, you don't want to have to put that into your CRM system for this service or whatever. It's better to have it in a place that's related to the, the family in this case. And then associations. So people who actually have uh, multiple touch points for the organisation. If we look at banking, we not only have different types of banking products, you know, savings account, credit card, mortgage, etc. But uh, we maybe have different uh, relationships with the bank because we are the treasurer of the local sporting club or you know, that sort of thing. So uh, being able to model that in a way that is very fast to access for digital services is going to be valuable for banks especially. And finally the propensity to churn, that is that you will go, you'll leave this company and move to another organisation. That's something that they do keep track of. That would be something that's very interesting as soon as you log in to the marketing team, for example, that sends you new offers, tell you about a, a discount or whatever. If that model is an entitlement, then uh, as soon as you log into the portal or your mobile app or whatever, you've got access to it. So entitlements are really important and go well beyond just the traditional, can I access this? So <coughs> if we look at questions about evaluating entitlements, that was you know, pretty high level stuff about how to model and, and what the issues are. But when we look at um, actually evaluating them, we have to look at how much do we actually model in schema? And that means how can we make changes in the future? How can we respond to the development teams who want to stand up new things and need new entitlements created? Do different applications need different values? So you know, it's nice having in one place, but especially a, an out-of-the-box application like a SAP or a, a Siebel or something, it's got its own model for how it represents people and, and entitlements. Maybe you actually need to then modify what you're sending back to that application that's different to the applications that you've written yourself. Do we represent entitlements as scopes in an OAuth token? Well, that could be good. The issue, of course, is similar to the role maintenance problem, is the more scopes you have, the more you have to maintain them. And then, potentially, the more is in the token itself. Uh, or do you get applications to perform back-channel REST calls at runtime to get the entitlements themselves? So that will depend heavily on how much the application can be changed to make those calls. So <coughs> I think one of the methods we can do here is, um, as well as allowing uh, these things to be put into scopes in the token uh, to allow REST calls and so on, is to actually have a data access gateway in the middle, which can uh, model entitlements on the fly and enable a lot of flexibility for those particular issues that we're trying to solve. And that's something that Ping has in their product set, which is called Ping Data Governance. So this is a really lightweight product that is essentially an API proxy. Uh, it's specifically tailored to data access decisions. So it enables you to do fine-earned access control. It is built around ZACML, but there's no need to write ZACML. Has anyone written ZACML here? What's no? ZACML, X, it's XACML. It is basically writing code in XML, which no human wants to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, and it also has policy engines so that you can make your decisions in the product if you need to. So it can be uh, an inline gateway or it can actually ac in, um, be accessed in a side a sidecar model as well. The important thing is what it does is really fast runtime evaluation of data. So your client's making an API call, uh, data governance is making a call out to your entitlement services and that could be ping directory or it could be other directories as well. So open LDAP, um, you know, the, the four drop directory, etc, etc. It could be databases, it could be um, microservices. So there's a whole lot of back-end connectors 
in the product that lets you get data from where you want it to live. So you don't have to buy Ping directory to work with this. But what it does is it grabs the data and then it's able to evaluate the policies and some of those policies might be to block access because of what the, the information there is. Uh, it might be to evaluate the user's consent and then allow or deny access. It might be to transform some of the data. So if my client is an internal application, I'll return the date of birth field. But if it's a third party developer, I'll transform the data so it just tells the developer that I'm over the age of 18. <coughs> so I'm not losing control of my date of birth, um, PII, to a third party in that way. Um, and it's able to obfuscate data as well, so block out certain parts of it, like credit card numbers and, and what have you. So it gives you a lot of capability in actually allowing or denying access uh, to data. And some of that data can be entitlements. So in the case that you have some entitlements that can't be stored centrally and then given out to applications, you can have this gateway in the middle doing some transformation on the fly for that particular application or service. So again, gives a lot of flexibility. And, um, <coughs> sorry, should have taken that slide out. Anyway, so you've got the, the, the acronyms there, the, the PEP, the PDP, and the PIP, um, the traditional uh, data access terms. Um, so I think this, this approach gives people a lot of flexibility. Uh, it means that they can modify the data returned to clients depending on the requirements, the requirements of the client, but also the requirements of the organisation in terms of data access policy. Uh, you can start to do OAuth token exchange. So that's something that is, um, I think it's ratified now as a spec. Uh, it'll be in our product very, very soon. And it gives you the ability for, say, the, the data governance gateway to say, well, Mr. Client, you've given me a token for Mark, but it's got all these scopes that you, know, you don't need for this transaction. I'm going to exchange it for a token which has much less in terms of token, uh, in terms of scope so that we start to model uh, access control via that in a very easy way. Um, and you don't have to do Zachmo as a drag and drop tool, so uh, keeps everybody's sanity. All right, so to summarise before we get into questions, I think entitlements are really important. Uh, this is something I've been talking with our uh, development teams about for about a year and this is something we're gradually building more, more and more stuff into our products to enable out of the box. Uh, it's important for customers and they want guidance from us. They want to know how to secure access given the sort of regulatory challenges they have and the sort of the spread of access that they need from all sorts of services. I think modelling entitlements using JSON is a great idea and you can see the sort of steps and the things that we've done there to enable that. Of course, I would say that because I've got a product that models JSON natively. But yeah, it's not the only way, but it certainly is a, a good way of doing it. Um, evaluating entitlements via REST uh, is a good way of doing it as well, just because of the application landscape now and the ability then to use that in, say, a microservices architecture and, and so on. But importantly, directories ha continue to have a huge role to play in securing access. Um, like Howard said, it's still it's all about the directory. Uh, what we need to be able to do is explain to people why that is important and why it's an elegant solution for their requirements so they don't end up in NoSQL land. Um, I think, you know, over this, as, as vendors and so on, we need to provide more out of the box so that people don't have to be developing their own IP around this. However, the flip side of that is that everyone's a bit different. So there's a middle ground where we provide enough for them to get going and then there's room for people like yourselves who, who do consulting and so on to help people with their specific requirements. 
Okay, so that's all I have for today. Happy to take any questions. You can um, get hold of me here. Um, I put a lot of my material together on my website. So yeah, feel free to get in contact. Thank you, Mark, for the really great uh, description of uh, the problem. And I'm really happy that I didn't have to follow you because I think you did a lot better than I did. <laughs> So, a couple of questions. Uh, number one, with respect to the data model and the directory, um, maybe you said it and I missed it, but is there a, a particular schema element that's being used to store the JSON string? Yeah, so we have a JSON attribute schema element, and that enables you to do all that schema checking and so on across the whatever you store in JSON. Is that something specific to, say, the unbound LMAP server, or is that something that uh, model and other back ends, or? Uh, you would need native support in a back end, but it's certainly, you know, it, it's very open what, how we've, um, you know, modeled that. And I've just pulled the example straight out of our public documentation there, so other people could start to look at supporting that, yeah. Interesting idea. Um, yeah. So it's a syntax? It's a syntax, exactly. Yeah. And then you need all the back end stuff to say, you can't put this element in, you know, this value in this element and so on. Yeah. See the server guys nod their heads. Um, so that's <laughs> cool. Um, and then, you know, so yeah, you have to model the data and store the data, and then you have to be able to evaluate the data. And then you would hope that the, the uh, Talbot system is interoperable across different kinds of access management uh, evaluators. Mm -hmm. So if you have any, because uh, I mean, and this is great, it looks like a great product. Um, do you have any suggestions or recommendations for you know, those of us that would want to interoperate with something like this? Would it just be a pure XACML? So nobody really uses SACML syntax anymore. It's all about REST APIs. So you can use REST APIs against our product and get back a JSON payload. Uh, or uh, we can put that information into an OAuth token. And, and represent that in that way. So you know, there are there are multiple ways of doing it. If you're looking for a, you know, a, a standard way of representing data, I'm not sure that exists. But it's not something that would you know be difficult to work through. I think. It's practically impossible, right, to have a standard. Data it is. Model it is. That's right. Star types of data types. Yeah. Um, and then as far as the evaluation of the application, is that something? Right. Yeah. So there are different ways of doing it. So you can do it at the gateway here, where you're getting a yes or no answer, or you know, with Zachmon, you can actually have a a no, but with information about why it's a no. Um, you can actually return it to the application and let it do its own decisioning, which is you know going to be used by some applications. Uh, and then you can use an intermediary specifically for applications who don't want to do that and don't want to have to make the call out. So you've got your traditional web access management style gateways and Ping has one of those where you can do that. There are other ones. Uh, so I think the, the Lemon NG people were showing before about how you can have something that evaluates the token and then sends information back using headers. That's essentially what uh, that model is with a uh, web access gateway. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone else? Or, yeah, okay, great. Okay, um, a more generic question about REST API. Do you think it's a good idea to rely on REST API for each uh, authorization attempt for an application? Do, do, is it a, a good move for uh, our uh, information systems to, to split uh, the application and uh, the way we, we, we check authorization? Don't, don't we, we have some performance problem uh, 
I'd like to, to uh, when they were like on, on the network course to, to have some conversations. Mm. Okay, well, that's a very broad question to answer. Um, yeah, I think that there's the potential for that to be a problem, certainly. Uh, you look at what some of my customers are doing, they're moving into microservices very heavily, it's all REST driven. They want something that can give out tokens per transaction. There's an overhead associated with that. And if you're making those type of decisions there where you're always making back channel calls saying, can I do this, can I do this, then that's an issue. And you know, I think we're yet to see how that plays out in terms of performance in real life. We can certainly talk about it as vendors. I think it's a, you know, a useful model for a lot of people, but until we get real world things happening, we won't really know. Uh, I think the opposite case is probably an issue though. If we provide you know, information at a point in time to an application and say, you know, this is, this is Mark and this is what he can do, um, then there is a window where things could change and there's a security aspect that has to be managed there. So it very much depends on the length of the window. If it's a day, then I'm at, I'm at home, you know, using an application and unfortunately I get uh, removed from the organisation, then you need to be able to shut off access. You need to be able to say it's no longer uh, okay for me to access those things. So when we start talking about windows, it's like with OAuth tokens. What's the, the time to live for the token that gives us usability without uh, upsetting the user, but keeps the security aspect low? So it's a great question. I don't really have an answer, except that we have to, I think, model things carefully for different workloads and different customer environments. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Thank you. Thanks very much.